complex kids are kids who struggle with some aspects of life, learning, behavior, or social issues, but not all. But if kids are struggling in some way to navigate or master the expectations of them around life and learning, then, then they're probably a complex kid. And, re- and these days, I think we've got a lot of complex kids. Diane alluded to this earlier. We're raising kids in complex times. And so kids who may not have been neurodivergent became complex kids during COVID and have become complex kids in the context of excessive access to technology. And like the world is shifting in a way that's creating complexity for us to parent and is really calling upon us to parent differently than our parents did. Today, I'm really excited, as I always am, to bring a really cool set of guests to you. These are two women that I've known for several years now, and the work that they do is so needed and just so fantastic. And every time I listen to them, I learn something new about just how to work with others, whether it's my clients, my students, my colleagues, my partner, my own kid. They're just a a wealth of information and knowledge on the coach approach to relationships. So let me let me introduce them formally. Elaine Taylor Klaus and Diane Dempster co-founded impactparents.com in 2011 because traditional parenting advice wasn't working for their complex kids and they found no training or coaching available designed specifically to support them as parents of complex kids. Now internationally recognized as leading parent educators in the world, they use a coach approach to help parents reduce the stress of raising children, teens, and young adults with ADHD, anxiety, autism, learning differences, and more. The creators of Sanity School Behavior Training, they're authors of many books, including Parenting ADHD Now, Easy Intervention Strategies to Empower Kids with ADHD, and The Essential Guide to Raising Complex Kids with ADHD, Anxiety, and More. So as I said, every time I listen to them, I'm just blown away. We recently did a series of talks together that were similarly impactful. So I'm so glad they agreed to be on the podcast and talk to all of us today about their work and how they work to support parents of complex kids. And what are complex kids? Do you have one? So take a listen and I hope you enjoy it. Well, Diane and Elaine, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really excited for this conversation. So excited to be with you. Always, actually. Always, always, always. Let's start by just having you tell us about the work that you do and then what your journey was to getting into this work. Oh, the backstory, right? So how did we start into this work? So I started into this work in 2008. I left corporate like about a million other people. And just got to decide what I wanted to be when I grew up and decided to go and get my certification as a professional coach. And about the same time, my one of my kids was diagnosed with ADHD and so started looking at how do I support this child? I'm a neurotypical adult. I have a type A get it done mom with this quirky kid that wasn't quite fitting in the mold and decided I wanted to help him help that community do something in that realm. And in the process of becoming a coach, realized that I was doing a lot of my own work and that by doing my own inner work, it was really helping me to support my kiddos in a very different way. And so the shortcut answer is when I became a coach, I became a much better parent. And when I met Elaine, she had had similar experiences, but we came from different personality types, different backgrounds, that sort of stuff. And so we came together and said, well, what can we do to support the ADHD community and realized that the support that was lacking at the time was supporting parents and that we both had felt very isolated, very marginalized even about, you know, with kids as as they got diagnosed or not diagnosed and those sorts of things. Elaine, what would you add to the backstory? Clearly, when we became coaches, we became, I would say, significantly better parents to our complex kids. And it wasn't rocket science. It was something we could teach. But for me, my story started differently. I actually came into coaching to support parents specifically because I had I had been struggling mightily as a parent of a really complex kid 
several kids, but one super complex. I now have come to call very complex. And they're just, I was lost and I was overwhelmed. And I didn't at that time know that I had my own learning and attention issues that was diagnosed a little later. And I just needed some help. And the only thing available to me at the time was a therapist, which was helpful for a while, but it wasn't really what I needed. I needed a Sherpa, you know, I needed someone to guide me through the process and help me make sense of it all. And coaching was introduced to me as a, as a modality to like manage it all. And so I was actually on my way back to graduate school to become a therapist to work with parents when I was introduced to coaching. And I, I called my husband the first afternoon in tears and I said, this is it. I found it. Like, this is what it's about. Because coaching is an empowerment-based approach and it's a change management-based approach. So it's all about how do we meet these amazing, quirky kids where they are and help them become, step into their full potential in a way that is inspiring and empowering to them and to me as a parent, because I was so lost in the process and coaching really, as Diane said, it gave, you know, co the secret to coaching is it's the best kept personal development secret in the world is to get coach training. And so I really shifted who I was being as a parent. And it was more about who I was being than what I was doing. That's so wonderful to hear. And I hear from both of you just the, you know, enthusiasm and passion just dripping from your voices when you talk about this. And it's one of the reasons I love hearing you talk about the work you do. What does that look like when you work with, with parents? Well, I, I would say the secret sauce is that we bring coaching skills and communication skills to parents of complex kids, often we say to the parents of complex kids and the professionals who support them. And, and so we do this, this hybrid combination of training with coaching and support. We originally started off thinking we're, we were going to do pure coaching. And it became very clear that in this audience, there was a training component that was really needed. So we do kind of coach salting, I think is how we would describe it. But it's, it's bringing the philosophies and the tools and the constructs from coaching to the family space as a way to really foster independence and personal development and growth because complex kids are a personal growth development opportunity, <laughs> right? They need more conscious personal development and growth than neurotypical kids. The other piece I would add is that there's so much information out there, right? It's a sort of, there's so many podcasts, great podcasts like yours, like ours, like everything else, webinars, I mean, everything else. And parents tend to get stuck in information. And that's really where coaching helps. It's this sort of, I can take what I'm learning, figure out how do I make it work for me? How do I make it work for my family? What do I do if it doesn't work more than once? You know, it's this sort of how do I make it sustainable and personalized is kind of the way I talk about it is this sort of, I need more than just information. Most of us, particularly because a lot of, if kids have, are neurodivergent, their parents on, percentage wise are, are likely the same way, or they're really stressed and overwhelmed, which makes us feel like we're neurodivergent. And so it's hard to do the things that the experts tell us. And that's really where coaching comes in because it's about, meeting you where you are. Wow. I'm having a hard time. I a mom yesterday. who's like, I know I'm supposed to be consistent, but I have a really hard time being consistent. And it, the consistency is a four letter word for a lot of people, right? I know it is for me. And it's like, okay, so let's help you figure you're not a consistent human. That's cool. That's who you are. Let's not make that right or wrong. Let's figure out how to work around that and figure out are there things that you could do that might be more towards what people would call consistent? And are there things that the variety makes it easier. So what you're describing and the way we often talk about it is taking the information and integrating it and then implementing it. But to focus on the, what you're trying to achieve and to focus on the process rather than the tools. So instead of you've got to be consistent, well, what's important about consistency? What are you trying to achieve by being consistent in a child's life? Then how do you design a system or a structure or an approach that meets that need in a way that works for the parent. That's the shift is that we're focusing on the process instead of only the outcome. Because you can give any parent in the world a reward chart, but that doesn't mean it's going to work. 
Well, and it's not just about the process for the parent, but it's also the process for the kid, which is what you just described. With our kids, we're not just focused on how do I get them to turn in their homework? How do I get them to hang up their towel? How do I get them to do the thing that I need them to today? It's the process of figuring out, wow, it's hard for me to remember stuff. If I need to remember something, what's something that might work for me? Because ultimately we're trying to launch independent, strong adults, right? Not just get the stuff done today. Right. I don't want to be testing to make sure the toothbrush is wet, right? When they're 18 years old, I want to make sure that they've got some buy-in and know how to get themselves to brush their teeth, even when they're tired at the end of the day. Right. Right. So let's back up a little bit. Elaine, you used the term complex kids. Can you tell us what you mean by that? So I the, the definitions morphed over the years. When I, when I wrote The Essential Guide, my, my editor asked me to define it. So I spent a little time playing with it. I think the shorthand version is complex kids are kids who struggle with some aspects of life, learning, behavior, or social issues, but not all. But if kids are struggling in some way to navigate or master the expectations of them around life and learning, then, then they're probably a complex kid. And, re- and these days, I think we've got a lot of complex kids. Diane alluded to this earlier. We're raising kids in complex times. And so kids who may not have been neurodivergent became complex kids during COVID and have become complex kids in the context of excessive access to technology. And like the world is shifting in a way that's creating complexity for us to parent and is really calling upon us to parent differently than our parents did or even than we were raised to. Well, and what you're describing, I love that word struggle, right? Kids who struggle with, right? And so everybody struggles at some point. And a lot of times our kids are struggling and they aren't even aware that they're struggling. And so if that's the cool thing about what we do is that it, you don't have to have a kid with ADHD or anxiety or autism or whatever the label happens to be. You've got a kid who's struggling. These are just amazing tools that you can use to support them in navigating through the struggles and beginning to figure out how do I navigate struggles on my own. Well, and Diana and I have been playing with this a little bit lately, but we do what we call neurodiversity inclusive coaching. That's the work that we do. That's what we teach. And what we realize is there's this whole vehicle out there of ADHD coaching and and your work, you do executive function a lot of work around executive function coaching. And what we do for parents is neurodiversity inclusive coaching, right? So it's it's all aspects of neurodivergence and how it shows up and how do you integrate that and make it work in, in the world. Yeah. One of the things I want to pull back out of what Diane was saying earlier with this conversation you were recounting with a mom who seems like she was feeling a lot of shame around consistency. And you also mentioned the expectations that are put on these kids and the the struggles they may have meeting those expectations. I think one of the most amazingly empowering parts of coaching is that it's a totally judgment-free practice, right? Yes. And yes, it's so wonderful. And it's when we can create that space and that trust with the teenager, you know, they always amaze you. And for parents to be able to create that relationship with their teenagers, I mean, that's everything we could always hope for, right? But I I think that parents are plagued with a lot of shame and a lot of expectations, particularly women, right? So talk to us a little bit about that, how that shows up in your work and the kinds of things that you encourage parents to think about if they're struggling with shame. I want to pull those apart because absolutely shame, absolutely expectations. What was coming up for me as you were segueing there, Sheila, is parents will say, well, yeah, I can be non-judgmental. I can meet my kid where they are. I can give them space to develop and grow and be three to five years behind their peers, but the world's not going to let them do that. And they're not, you know, it's this sort of, there's this pressure we feel because we have a story about the external expectations, right or wrong. It's yes, often it is true. And what it does is it pushes us into this space where we're driving our kids as much as we think the outside world might eventually drive them. And that creates a barrier to change because what you were alluding to is that the the connection and the space and the relationship is really what has to happen. And if we're so focused on the expectation, we're not focusing on the relationship piece of it. I'm thinking about, you know, the name of the podcast, right, is Don't Force It. 
And, and there's something, so what you're speaking to is the parent's relationship with the child or the kids in terms of the relationship with shame and judgment. And I was listening to your question as a parent with neurodivergence, thinking about the shame that I experienced as a parent with, when I would do everything the experts told me to do and it wouldn't work. And then I would feel like, oh my God, I'm, now I'm really a failure or something's really wrong with my kids. And what, what we hear from parents a great deal in our community, and we talk about the judgment-free zone, right, is this is the first time they've ever felt not judged, where they're getting some permission to let go of the shame and the blame and the embarrassment. And, you know, especially those of us who have our own neurodivergence, it is really hard to raise these kids sometimes and to see your kids not hitting the same metrics that your peers' kids are hitting or that you think they're hitting, they may or may not be. And because everybody comes in thinking they're the only ones. And then they come into our communities and they come into our groups and they're like, oh my God, all these other parents from all over the world and all over the country are saying the same thing. I had no idea. And that's so powerful. It's so powerful to realize you're not alone. And that if we can put down the stick that we've been beating ourselves over the head with all these years, and sort of give ourselves permission to be with the kids we've got, not the kids we thought we should have, it changes everything, absolutely everything. But our shame can interfere so powerfully with our capacity to be with our kids that we actually end up projecting the shame onto them. Yeah. And interfering with their development. Yeah. Well, and we're fighting the tide, you know, as you're talking about, you know, putting this stick down a lane, I was thinking about how many as adults, it's like we motivate ourselves by like beating ourselves up. It's like, you know, I got to achieve, I got to do, I got to accomplish. And it works. Accomplish. And, and it works, right? And part of it is just the place our society is right now, not to make it right or wrong, but it's the reality of it. And so if we want to do it differently, there's this space we need to move into to say, okay, wait a second, I got to find something else to do besides beat myself up because we, we all still need motivation and inspiration and all those things to accomplish the stuff of life. But if it's not pressure, then what is it? it? (laughs) Yeah. Is it? Yeah. Am I getting anywhere if I'm not like in pain while I'm doing it? (laughs) Right. Well, think about how many times you you see somebody you haven't seen in a while. How are you? And and there's this almost status people carry to, oh, I'm so busy. Yeah. Oh, I've got so much. There's so much. It's like, and I I remember saying to myself, I'm going to stop using the word busy. And I started just saying, life is full. That's a great shift. Right? Because I want to see the joy in it, not just, it's not like, I don't want my busyness to be some status that I'm, you know, achieving or something. So in our group this week, we do a, a coaching group that meets twice a month and there's a different theme each week. And this week's theme was what we call shifting expectations and or setting realistic expectations. And what I found myself talking about with the parents this week wasn't about our expectations of the kids, but was about helping kids think about their expectations for themselves and the ways in which they take on expectations that may be unrealistic or they're, they take on expectations because they think they're supposed to, or and to really begin to guide kids to that ownership we were talking about earlier by helping them begin to set expectations for themselves. It's a shift, but it's really powerful. But that shift that I think we all kind of see we need to make, right? We don't want to sort of sell our kids into the cycle of burnout that we find ourselves on. And and I think it has so much to do with a lot of these external factors, like the fact that, you know, there are more women in the workplace. And as women, we are still struggling with well, how do I balance being a mom and and doing it all at work as well? And we're really the first generation to have to navigate that at you know such a large percentage, and and it's tough, right? I know so many people who feel like they are just on all the time, and they are full time mom and also executive, whatever, right? But it, it does strike me that our generation has the chance to break some cycles, some really really important cycles. <laughs> to break. And I think that the work is not just on our kids. And I I look at Gen Z and, you know, younger generations, and I'm always just so impressed with the way they raise the bar for how we should treat each other, how we should take care of each other and the earth and think about things differently. I, I just applaud it so much. 
but it's on us too, right? The work of breaking a cycle is is really difficult and it starts with that sort of inner work and changing the way we show up in relationships and, and how we're being, not necessarily what we're doing, like you said, Elaine. Exactly. Exactly. And I, I mean, there's a book that a colleague of ours came out with last year about ADHD and women with ADHD and the traditional role of women and how much harder it is because of the expectations. And I think Diane and I are just old enough where we can look at our generation versus your generation. And I see it's so much better already in your generation. And then I know that my kids' expectations of what is equality in a marriage is going to be completely different from what it was when we stepped into marriage, you know, 30 years ago. So the change is happening. Sometimes it's hard to see it when you're in it. And so, but when you pull back, there really is a huge shift in how younger people are setting boundaries and setting limits and setting expectations in a different way than we ever even thought we were allowed to. Well, and then there's this balance of, because we're all existing at the same time, the expectations are still there and the call to take care of each other is still there. And there's this beautiful dynamic of both and finding that space. And that's, to me, that's just the beautiful aspect of the whole thing. So, you know, when I think about the work you do, and when I talk to my clients about the work you do, because I, I really do think every one of my clients should be working with you because we can't just, you know, fix things for the kid and not think about the conditions in the home and parenting relationships and things like that. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about what you do to help parents really define their roles in their relationships with their with their kids and how that can really help in a home where there are maybe complex adults as well as complex kids. So the framework that we talk about talks about four different roles of the parent, the director, the collaborator, the supporter, and the champion. And, you know, I think the word director, we all know what that word inherently means. You're the lead, you're setting the pace, you're creating the motivation, you're, you know, I have this visual of ducks following the little mama <laughs> across the pond, right? And we have this dream of when our kids are independent and they're doing the things and we're just there to smile and champion and those sorts of things. And the real work really lives in the middle. And most of us don't have the skills it takes. We're just talking to a group about this today. It's like we know what collaboration and looks like in the workplace. Collaboration at home, That's that, what does that even look like when our teens are fighting us and they don't want to talk to us and they don't want anything to do with us? Like, how do I collaborate with this human that won't even talk to me half the time, right? It's a sort of the dance is figuring out how to be in supporting and collaborating iteratively as your kids are needing or not needing or not acknowledging needing the various levels of support. You know, so what's coming up for me is that we're about taking a coach approach. And, and on a fundamental level, coaching is about being for other. It's about creating a space to allow another person to reach their full potential, which is what ideally, I believe, parenting should be about. And I think part of the parenting journey for a lot of people is to figure out, how, is to step out of, I'm supposed to make this kid do BX and shifting out of that into how do I kind of like allow the figure to emerge from the stone, right? How do I allow this human being to unfold into their full potential? And that's a very different framework for parenting than what most of us were raised with. And I think that's what coaching leads us to, but it relies on a certain amount of trust that this person's going to end up being like, I mean, I deal with it. I, I have really independent young adult children. And I was talking to my mother about it today is 87. And, you know, and she was, cause we're talking about the problem with raising these really independent kids is then they become really independent thinkers. And that's what we want for them on some level, but not all parents I think do. And my mother was saying that she did want it. And it turned out okay for her, you know, but it is a little scary because you can't, you're not controlling them and you don't get to control the narrative when you foster independence. 
Right. Well, and I think it's funny because you were using the word full potential and what was coming up for me almost like as a trigger is like, I hear parents say all the time, but he's not reaching his full potential. He's not working to his full potential, right? It's just sort of, there's this story of what we have of what their full potential is. And then there's a difference, which is just the stone revealing itself into the sculpture, which is what we're alluding to. And it's like, how do we not put our expectations of what full potential means on our kids and just let them emerge however they're going to emerge without the pressure of, oh, I've got to make it look a certain way or they've got to make it look a certain way. Well, but there's a, a whole, there's a whole bunch of trust involved in that. And I think that's a trust that, that a lot of parents, a lot of people are afraid of Yeah. yeah. what happens when people because they're going to become more independent. They're going to go on on a path that may not be the path you expected for them. I mean, I certainly never expected my kids to become artists and actors. And like, you know, I was an academic. I thought, you know, like I didn't expect it. And this is who they are. Yeah. One of the things I talk about with our clients who are embarking on the college admissions process, which I really see as sort of a microcosm of raising a child, it's it's like the boss fight at the end of raising a child for a lot of people, right? But one of the things I tell them to do as they embark is to get really clear about what they're afraid of. Because if they don't know, then that fear is going to drive the process, right? They're always going to feel behind you're talking about the parent or the kid? The parent. The parent. It's gonna their fear is gonna get in in the way of the student. And it's gonna get in the parent's way too. And the parent is just gonna drive themselves crazy thinking they did something wrong or they're behind schedule or we need to do more because we're aiming for this or that school. But most of the time, their fixation on a particular school is based on a fear that their child won't get to be who they think their child should be. Right. And that's that's so much about them and not anything to do with their kid. And by the way, if you're operating from fear, you know, you're not as creative, you're not as collaborative, you're not as problem solving focused or just or collaborative. Yeah. Right. It's exactly so much harder to ask for help when you're when you're paralyzed in your own fear. Oh, it's such a that's such a brilliant point. You know, as a parent who had one kid who didn't go to college, which was really weird and hard for me one who did and went, you know, that traditional high end, and then one who got into the process and said, you guys are making this way too complicated. I'm applying to two schools. And that I was able to support him in making that choice was only because thank you for that observation. We had done the work to not worry about what was going to happen as a result. But that was my third kid (laughs) and a lot of years of work. Yeah. You had some experience. Yeah. You know, it, it, this is, at the end of the day, what, the, what you're speaking to and what you started with the beginning, Diane, is that the work of parenting is about the parent, right? Like the kid becomes this beautiful piece of art as a result when you allow it to emerge from the stone. But the work is our own deep work as parents. Well, and the thing that, we, that I think, Sheila, you said this, we were getting ready for the, to record and you said, you know, parents create the conditions for success. That's our job. Parents create the conditions for success. We're not there to create the success or manage the success. We're there to create the conditions for success. And ultimately, honestly, guys, we don't know what success really looks like. And we don't know ultimately what the conditions are that will make that happen. So we just sometimes have to just do the best we can and lean into that trust that we've been talking about through this whole piece of it. And that's got to be the hardest part of it is because... Fear makes us micromanage. We can let go. We can see the beauty and let it come out. So back to that question about what's a complex kid. Yes, to everything you just said, Diane. And when you have complex kids, it kind of amps it all up another layer. Because there is reason to be concerned that the kid's not going to make it. Kid's not going to be successful. The data is against us. The stats are, you know, like there are real concerns when you have kids with neurodivergence, when you have kids with executive function challenges, there are more obstacles on their path. And that doesn't mean that they can't be successful but at all, because they can be amazingly successful. But what I think it does mean is that it's all the more important that we help them understand themselves well enough 
so that they want to take ownership of themselves so we can help them learn to navigate and manage themselves. Because the kids we're talking about really, back to the beginning of this conversation, really need to be in the process of problem solving for themselves. They have to have a sense of ownership in order to be successful. When they do, they soar because these kids are, they're going to be amazing adults. You just got to get them there. And part of getting them there is getting them bought in to accepting that they have challenges to overcome and they have these extraordinary gifts. And it's the blend of the two that is their brilliance. That was really beautifully said, Elaine. I think that's probably a great place to leave it. If people want to know more about what you do or set up a time to talk to you, how can they do that? So we have a free, do we have a free guide? We could. (laughs) You're welcome to. We'll link it in the show notes. Yeah. So let's put a free guide at impactparents.com slash force. And we'll put a free guide out there about really understanding your role versus your child's role in terms of getting help. So it's this sort of when is when is your child ready to get support versus when is the support focus more to be on you? And the other thing I'll share is that we have a ton of resources on our website at impactparents.com. We'll give you access to download a free gift. And we encourage you to, in all your free time, Go play a little bit on the site because there's a really robust blog. There's the podcast that we've had 12 years of guest expert columns. There's really an extraordinary amount of material there to help you begin to see the world through the lens of a coach approach to parenting. And we invite you to, to come play with us and join us on our journey. It's transformational. And really what I will say, when Diane and I first started, our first tagline was enjoy the ride. And we shifted it because a lot of parents didn't believe that that was even possible. And so we shifted it to helping parents help kids. But but the secret sauce, the truth is that this approach to being in the world as a parent is a clear path to enjoy the ride of parenting. And so we invite people to join us on that journey. That's great. Well, thank you again so much for joining us. I'm sure we'll have you back to talk more specifics around some of this stuff on a future episode too. Thanks so much, Sheila. Thanks, Sheila. Well, folks, thanks for joining us. I know we're getting into the last month of the year and things can be very stressful academically for your kids, not only with finals coming up, just the the wintertime kind of drudgery. And then for some of you, the end of the college process. And I know that this part of the year just gets so stressful and you feel like you're racing against the clock. I want to encourage you to ask for help. You've got lots of people in your community and on your team who can help you, whether that's your kids, college counselor, friends who've been through this experience before, private counselors like me and my team. I've got a whole community that is free and available to you on Circle called How to Get Into College, where you can look at old webinars, find really helpful blogs and tips, and even come to office hours to get your problems solved with me directly. So I hope you don't hesitate to ask for help. I know so much of this is about your kids being willing to ask for help and hope you, hopefully you learned a little bit about something in in today's episode on how to create the conditions for that sort of willingness to ask for help. And good luck with everything and we'll see you next time. I'm gonna go